uh, once again, John, thank you for the invitation to participate in this and Andreas for all the work behind the scenes. Yes, at, at, within baseball, of course, there's this phenomenon of a pinch hitter when someone goes up to bat who was not scheduled to go up to bat. So here I am as the pinch hitter uh, for the day. But of course, anything to do with insulin, I'm always, I'm kind of always ready to go. So here I am I'm with my pinch hitter talk about hyperinsulinemia and some of its origins. So just to paint the relevance of this, lest you think, why are we talking about uh, an elevated hormone of just insulin, and why not talk about a, any of the other number of hormones? Why not have a talk about thyroid hormone? Uh, that's because the most common health problem worldwide is metabolic in nature. I highlighted some of this yesterday, but worldwide, about half of all adults, if not worse, um, suffer from the metabolic syndrome. And the metabolic syndrome is a, is a cluster of complications um, that always tend to go together. Um, as mentioned earlier, this was first discovered by one of my heroes, Ger uh, heroes Gerald Reven. Um, but before we ever called it the metabolic syndrome, this uh, compilation of problems, uh, it was referred to with some other names, one being the insulin resistance syndrome. And as a scientist, of course, I like precision. I like my science like I like my haircut. I like things to be very precise. And so, Calling it the insulin resistance syndrome is a wonderful way to understand the origins of the problem. Calling it the metabolic syndrome, we may look at these things and think they're unrelated, when in reality, they're all springing from the same common soil. And then finally, to make this relevant, why would a scientist devote his career to studying insulin resistance? It is because it, is, it connects every non-communicable chronic disease. Um, from the big ones to the, un to the scary ones like migraines uh, or, or Alzheimer's and dementia, and even to the less lethal but still very relevant problems of infertility with the most common forms of infertility, um, all, all derivative of one common problem, namely insulin resistance. That is not to say they may not have their own noxious stimuli. They certainly do have varying uh, and diverse and disparate contributors, but they do all have one thing in common, so why not try to address that one common core? And briefly, let's take a moment just to help you understand the relevance of talking about hyperinsulinemia, and we need to discuss or, or have a common definition of what insulin resistance is. One way of defining insulin resistance is starting at the level of the cell, because every single cell of the body has an insulin receptor. There are not many uh, so in other words, insulin can affect every single cell of the body without exception. Not a lot of hormones can make that same claim, um, will be susceptible or responsive to every single hormone. And not a lot of cells will respond to every hormone. So insulin is quite unique. Regardless of the cell type or tissue type, insulin will flow through the blood and come and knock on the door of a cell, a door that is specifically designed for insulin. In so doing, the cell will respond in, I will just refer to it as a generic action, because what insulin does at a brain cell is very different from what it does at a bone cell or from a lung cell to a liver cell. No surprise that it's all a very different response. Insulin's most famous action, but not its most important, is what it does with regards to blood glucose levels. Unfortunately, this effect is so famous that many people can't separate the two. You can have a conversation with the, uh, a conventionally trained clinician and say, that's wonderful that you've measured the glucose, but why not measure the insulin? And they may have a hard time appreciating that they might not always be in the exact same area, high or low. Nevertheless, when insulin comes and knocks on the door of some cells, like muscle and fat cells, for example, or some cells of the hippocampus with memory and learning, it will open the doors for glucose to come from the plasma, from the blood, into the cell, thereby lowering plasma glucose, the manifestation of insulin's most famous effect. However, due to certain stimuli that I'll mention in a moment, the action can become diminished. Insulin is knocking on the door but the cell isn't answering anymore. One famous consequence of this is that glucose levels will be elevated. But similarly, if this given amount of insulin politely knocking on the door is insufficient to get the cell to do what insulin wants it to do, then what was a polite amount of insulin becomes an angry mob. And insulin levels 
now go up. And so we have hyperinsulinemia. And now it is this angry mob pounding on the doors of the cell, all in an effort to try to take what has become a diminished insulin action and restore it back to where it was, to varying levels of efficacy. So this brings me to the twofold definition of what insulin resistance actually is, or the two sides of the coin. One being the actual insulin resistance part of it, where a cell or some cells of the body are not responding as well to the hormone insulin as they were before. But that is just some cells. Other cells of the body are responding as well as ever. And that becomes a particular problem in light of the other side of the coin, which is that throughout the entire body, there is hyperinsulinemia. Insulin levels are elevated. So there is no case of we should be careful invoking insulin resistance without acknowledging that it will come with a hyperinsulinemia. And then I added this little comment, except in true starvation, um, where that is the exception. Now, this I want to just reinforce this idea that I just presented, which is a consequence of insulin resistance will be hyperinsulinemia. That's OK. Keep that idea in mind. This is an accurate reflection of, of that. Now, where does it come from? And this is getting us into the actual origins of hyperinsulinemia, because insulin resistance is hyperinsulinemia. I believe that there are what we should consider primary causes of insulin resistance. And then I'll emphasize at the end some secondary causes. The primary causes is, that's my own self-imposed definition where I determine that of all the myriad noxious stimuli that may contribute to insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, I want to pay attention to the ones that have been validated in all three most commonly used biomedical models. Isolated cells grown in cultures or laboratory rodents or humans at the top of it all. The three primary causes of insulin resistance, each being independent of the other, each capable of causing insulin resistance in every used biomedical model. The first is stress, and I'll elaborate on these in a little more detail. The second is inflammation, and finally, it's hyperinsulinemia itself. Firstly, with stress, I teach a graduate class in endocrinology at my university. It's one of my favorite assignments uh, because I have long appreciated the relevance of hormones and the ability of one cell in one part of the body sending a signal to a, a cell in another part of the body. When we talk about stress, it is very appropriate to invoke endocrinology because stress is defined by an elevation in stress hormones, or that's one way of defining it. That's how I define it. Elevations in cortisol and epinephrine. These are hormones that actually have almost nothing in common. They come from totally different cell types. They are produced in totally different ways. They move through the blood in different ways. They act on receiving or target cells in very different ways. They have almost nothing in common, except they both want to increase blood glucose. And they do so very, very well, very rapidly and in a sustained way, particularly in the case of cortisol. This means that they are antagonistic to insulin because the more these hormones are elevated and pushing up glucose, providing that upward pressure, the harder insulin must work and the body becomes ever more insulin resistant, responding less to insulin when these stress hormones are elevated. And as the body becomes more insulin resistant, insulin levels go up. So this is a contributor to hyperinsulinemia. Now, just to give you an example, sleep deprivation is what I submit to be the most common cause of stress, that it's less the anxiety we have about a relationship or something going on at work and more of what's really becoming a chronic sleep deprivation. Even one night of bad sleep, and a lot of us have come for over, from overseas, so we've had a lot of those bad nights, um, is enough to raise cortisol demonstrably the next day and quantifiably, demonstrably have more insulin resistance um, during that period. Now, thankfully, um, one good night of sleep will undo it. Uh, but nevertheless, sleep deprivation is a common cause of contributing to stress-induced hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. The next cardinal cause of insulin resistance was inflammation. And this was the focus um, that you, th of my postdoctoral work. Indeed, some of the citations I'm putting there in the corner, you'll see my name on them. Um, so when I was working with Duke, it was to understand the role of inflammation in contributing mechanistically 
to hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. And it all had to do with cytokines. Cytokines are basically a hormone of inflammation. It is these small molecules that are moving through the blood that will activate immune pathways throughout the body. And the, the reality is virtually every cell actually has immune pathways, even cells that are not overtly immune in purpose, like a macrophage or something like that. Nevertheless, regardless of the source, and I'll mention some in a moment, any time we're increasing pro-inflammatory cytokines, the body will become less insulin sensitive. And this is, of course, the case when it comes to infection and illness, um, but it's also the case with things more chronic, like an autoimmune disorder, where the body is just has a hypersensitivity. It's responding with an, an, an eliciting an immune response to something that should be benign. They're too sensitive to this should, what should be a benign stimulus. But also, we've published reports, and one of these citations is um, mentioning this, in, with air pollution, where with inhaled diesel particles, for example, that will induce an inflammatory state in the body that causes insulin resistance. The same with cigarette smoke, by the way. And then lastly, what I, uh, what I, a topic for another time, which I would love to address in a future series, would be the hypertrophy of fat cells and how when a fat cell gets excessively big, in my talk right after this one actually, I will mention just the incredible size difference that can occur between fat cells. Um, they will also become very, very pro-inflammatory, contributing to the inflammation throughout the body, all of which is causing the body to become less insulin sensitive and more hyperinsulinemic. Now, those first two matter. Stress and inflammation, they are absolutely contributors to hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance, but I believe they are not as significant as the contribution of hyperinsulinemia itself. Now, if you've been paying attention, you'll recall that I presented a paradigm just minutes ago that suggested hyperinsulinemia is a consequence of insulin resistance. Now you're wondering, Ben, what are you doing? Uh, I'm making the circle complete, which is that both uh, yes, hyperinsulinemia is a consequence of insulin resistance, but it is, a, it is also a cause. It is cause and consequence. And when there is too much insulin in the body, the body starts to become resistant to it. And this is reflective of a fundamental biological principle. If there is ever too much of something coming to a biological organism that doesn't kill it, the organism will attempt to reduce its sensitivity to that something whether it is bacteria responding to an antibiotic, whether it is tumor cells responding to a chemotherapy, um, the, the body will attempt to resist the stimulus lest it become pathological. It wants to maintain homeostasis. And so this was the paradigm I showed you earlier, and as I mentioned, we can in fact bring it full circle <coughs> where these, it creates a vicious cycle. Now, if you'll pardon me, much of what I do in life and much of my brain power is spent thinking about my wife and my children. And even there in my own home, there is a, 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 a metaphor of insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, where my darling wife is home with my kids. Now, they're all actually in school now. Um, our youngest is in school as well. But it has been her job. She's full-time mom, full-time homemaker. So she has spent a lot of time with the kids. And when I come home in the evening, and believe me, I attempt to get home as early as possible whenever I can to give my darling wife a break, I am struck by this dynamic within the home where the kids are very loud and they are always making these little demands. And they're, they're delightful. They're, you know how it is. They're kind of angelic demons um, in a way. But I'm, I'm always impressed by the fact that my children will be asking for something and my wife appears to be completely deaf to what my children are asking for. And that's because she hears it all the time. She's become a little deaf to their complaints or their cries or whatever the problem may be. However, I'm not around it all day as much as I am around it at night and I'm very involved um, every time I'm home. I hear it all with exquisite sensitivity and react very, very quickly whenever there's something because I don't hear it as much. I've not become deaf to the droning of my children, like my wife kind of has as a survival mechanism. Now, nevertheless, hopefully that metaphor helps cement the idea of how much of how this biological principle works, where too much of something, too much of standing by the speaker at a rock concert makes you deaf. That's sort of what's happening with hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. 
Now, insulin does a lot. Earlier, I had mentioned that the regulation of glucose is simply insulin's most famous effect. But if we only view insulin through the lens of glucose, we are doing insulin a tremendous disfavor. It affects every single cell, and its theme is to tell a cell what to do with energy. That is, I think, the simplest way of understanding what insulin does throughout the body. And here is just some of what insulin is doing here. But there is a molecule that can accumulate within the cell that disrupts some of these processes. It is never a global disruption where everything insulin's doing is broken. That doesn't happen. It is selective, which suggests that it's somewhere further down the biochemical stream. But there's a molecule called ceramides, which is the main molecule within a family of lipid or fats called the sphingolipids, named after the enigmatic sphinx, because for so long we didn't know what, these, what this class of, of fats actually did. But ceramides will directly block the insulin action, depending on the cell type, at numerous sites. And I just highlight a couple here. The glucose uptake contributing to the hyperglycemia of insulin resistance. Protein synthesis, which certainly could contribute to the sarcopenia or the muscle wasting of insulin resistance. And even sex hormone production, which is certainly something that's happening within the testes and the ovaries, most obviously in the ovaries with regards to polycystic ovary syndrome. So ceramides are a critical, and I'm using the indefinite article, a critical, not the critical, because I acknowledge there could be other um, contributors here. But within my own hands and my laboratory and others, we can make a cell insulin resistant by simply increasing the accumulation of ceramides. Now, how might we increase the ceramides? One way of increasing ceramides is by chronically bumping up insulin. My lab published that paper about five or six years ago. You can also increase ceramides through cortisol increases or any pro-inflammatory cytokine. These cardinal causes of insulin resistance cause insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia in part, and I would say large part, because of their activation of ceramide biosynthesis. Then this highly reactive lipid starts to accumulate and then creates the insulin resistance within the cell. Then as certain cells of the body are becoming insulin resistant, of course, we have the hyperinsulinemia again, which on this very slide is both cause and consequence. Now, my final sentiments in this talk, and I'm, John will pardon me for going a little beyond just the mechanisms of hyperinsulinemia by including um, this query and addressing it. Why has it become so common? Um, <clears throat> these are the three causes. One reason is because of just how common these um, stimuli are, sleep deprivation and, say, pollutants um, and, and various sensitivities as things in the food chain are changing in a way that maybe we're poorly adapted to. But with regards to hyperinsulinemia, which I believe to be the, the elephant in the room, it's really because of what we eat and how frequently we eat it. Uh, you may know, and I might have already mentioned in my talk yesterday, my fellowship, my postdoctoral work years ago was in Singapore, of all places, where Duke University has a campus there. And Singapore at the time was actively, aggressively inviting metabolic scientists to their lovely island in order to better understand, in part, some of the disparities across ethnicities. Um, why is it that Chinese Singaporeans were getting metabolic problems at such low body fat levels compared to, say, European Singaporeans, who could appear to be, uh, gain much more fat, and just their only consequence being they don't look as good in their Speedo as they did before? Well, even in Singapore, as it is, um, throughout the rest of the world, um, the global diet is roughly 70% carbohydrate. And of course, this is not fruits and vegetables, and they're not getting their roughs and their greens here. This is um, carbohydrates that come from bags and boxes with barcodes, so highly refined starches and sugars. So not only are we getting the vast majority of our calories globally from carbohydrates, it's worth then asking what is the effect of, those car of, of, this, of these macronutrients fats, proteins, and carbohydrates on insulin levels. And this is a reproduction of a study. You can't see the citation in the corner because of your um, view angle. Uh, but if a, if a human eats pure fat, they have no significant response to insulin whatsoever. This is no response. Pure, anyone who says otherwise, I don't know where they're getting their data from. We have replicated this experiment and we'll be publishing some results um, later this year or early next year. 
there's no insulin response to fat. Um, similarly, there is no insulin response to protein, or if there is, it can, it's quite modest. Now, in this one, I would add some of that depends on the individual and their inherent glucagon levels. And I hate to invoke a new protein here. But suffice to say, in a healthy individual, there appears to be no response, um, no insulin response to protein, although that effect can vary. What does not vary, really, across the population is the response to pure carbohydrate. If someone eats pure glucose, and remember, I'm not making these data up. It is a direct um, reproduction where I outlined a study because I, I wanted to keep my own particular aesthetic. For a guy who's freckled and bald and wrinkled, you, you're surprising how much I care about how things look, right? But I, but I do. Um, so here we have insulin going up 10 times. And even in a healthy, insulin-sensitive person, it will take up to three hours or so before the insulin comes back down to normal. What if we had someone with insulin resistance consume that exact same amount of glucose? In this case, now the insulin may go up to 20 times and could take four or five hours to come back down. That matters tremendously, the timing of it. When we look at how we have adjusted the frequency with which we eat, because that is just as much a problem as what we're eating. It's how often. And just as a reminder, most of what we eat is carbohydrates. So let's take an uncommon individual. Uncommon for multiple reasons. The first being this uncommon person only eats three meals in a day. And this is what their insulin levels may look like. I'm very exaggerating the two phases of insulin secretion here. But suffice it to say, the person has low insulin when they wake up. They eat a starchy, sugary breakfast. It's gone up. Three hours later-ish, it comes back down. And then an hour or so later, they have lunch. And then an hour or so, you know, a few hours after the insulin has come down, they have dinner. And then in this uncommon person, they've stopped eating for the day. Uncommon, again, because this person's only eating three times a day, three meals. Of course, the common individual is snacking. And so an hour or two after they've had one meal, they have filled in that gap. And so in this uncommon for the final reason, insulin sensitive person, because that's increasingly not common, they are still spending every waking moment in a state of hyperinsulinemia, again, because of what they're eating and how frequently they're eating it. Now, if we once again, if I superimpose the insulin uh, levels in someone who's insulin resistant, it gets even worse. There's no hint of the insulin coming down. Because remember, in this person's body, insulin may take five hours before it is approaching its fasted level. And by then, they have long eaten their snack to bump it back up. And so uh, to really put a fine point on it, the frequency and the, and the substance of what we're eating creates a situation where every waking moment is spent hyperinsulinemic and unfortunately, in many people, well into their non-waking moments, where it may be several hours into their sleep, where they're still hyperinsulinemic. And just to show you how rapidly this can happen, this was a human study. Once again, I am overlaying my own graphics on the actual figure, so I'm reproducing it. They had these individuals overeat carbohydrates for one week. And over the course of this week, every day, they had them come in for a fasted blood test. And you'll see that the fasted glucose levels, despite overeating carbohydrates every day, did not change. They stayed normal throughout the entire week. And so if we only had a glucose-centric paradigm of metabolic health, we would say, well, they're perfectly healthy. They're normal. You know better now, which is to say you would wonder, well, what about the insulin? And indeed, fasted insulin, this is not right after, this is not postprandial, fasted insulin levels went up by two and a half times over the course of this week of just overeating carbohydrates, just seven days. This is insulin resistance, normal glucose, but manifesting with ever more insulin in order to try to keep the glucose in check. So the hyperinsulinemia reflected, reflective of the body working harder. Now, these are the primary causes. And just because I know some of you are wondering about other causes that you're insistent should be on this list, there are others that I acknowledge that I consider to be secondary, like uric acid. And I'm very good friends um, with Dr. Rick Johnson at Colorado, who's made it his whole career to understand the role of uric acid in metabolic health. In fact, we're collaborating on a project to understand the degree to which ketones offset the inflammation of uric acid. And then linoleic acid from refined seed oils. And Nina introduced us to that topic very well yesterday. So with regards to uric acid, why do I not consider it to be primary? 
even though there's evidence in all three biomedical models to support it, it's because if you eliminate the inflammation, you eliminate the insulin resistance. So I consider it secondary because it's feeding through a primary mechanism. And then with regards to linoleic acid, I consider it secondary because there are good data that support it as a cause, but there's nothing in humans directly that I've seen of a human eating a diet that's increased it. There are very good studies that have looked at cardiovascular outcomes, but none that I'm aware of that have measured insulin resistance in response. So there is cell data, there's rodent data, but there's still a gap there that prevents me from considering it as primary. Thank you. Thanks for letting me be the pinch hitter and for entertaining me, and I'd be happy to address any questions before you hear from me again in just a few minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. OK, so let's start with the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ben, for your talk. Uh, so with the last, um, the previous slide, if you take the higher insulin after an episode of overeating, how long does it take to get it back to normal after an episode of overeating? Let's say we're talking about a binge eating mm -hmm. disorder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it really depends on a handful of variables, so I want to be careful. But if we were taking an insulin-sensitive person, um, it would be more complicated than what I showed you here, depending on what they were eating, what they were binging on. If it was something like my personal indulgence, which I work very hard to control, like a bowl of cereal, um, sugary, crispy cereal, I will eat myself sick on every night if it's in the home. and. Um, if I were to binge on that, I'm a reasonably healthy, insulin-sensitive guy, <clears throat> but I, we only have whole milk in my home, and fat will change, and protein even, but that will change the degree to which the, the glucose is hitting the bloodstream. So it will prevent the, the, the peak from being quite as high, but the area under the curve stays roughly similar because it compresses it and it just extends it out a little bit. It delays the um, digestion of the glucose. Um, so it... So it does depend on whether it's mixed macronutrient and the overall quantity. But I would say for the average person, <clears throat> three to five hours is going to be the time frame in which the, the insulin will come back down to a fasted level. And ideally, once it does, the person has shifted their metabolic fuel and they have metabolic flexibility where they turn off their sugar burning mode, if you will, and they move back into fat burning mode, um, which is reflective of metabolic flexibility, which is a topic for another time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Ben, for the talk. I'm Chin Ming from Singapore. Hey! You did mention about Singapore. So we uh, lived up at <laughs> Chochu Kong. Oh, OK. Because I couldn't good. afford uh, to live down. Mine is um, Bukit Bato. <laughs> yeah, I know okay. that area. Anyway, um, I'm glad that you mentioned about hyperinsulinemia as the cause of insulin resistance, the unsung heroes. Um, unsung I mean, villain. Be, no, hero, because you know, oh. it's a compensatory uh, mechanism you know, for people with hyperinsulinemia. Can you postulate what are the, some of the mechanisms why people get hyperinsulinemia first before they get insulin resistance? Yeah, <clears throat> in fact, that's how I believe it happens in most people. I believe in most instances of someone who's presenting with insulin resistance, that will very, very likely be a consequence of the hyperinsulinemia. Um, even though there are other stimuli like stress and inflammation, I believe those matter, but they're more modest contributors. So just to make it very clear, I believe most instances of insulin resistance are a consequence of hyperinsulinemia. And at the risk of repeating myself, I believe it's entirely a function of our very carb-heavy diet and the frequency with which we eat it. You know, like, for example, in Singapore, if I'm answering your question, I hope I am addressing the question appropriately, you know, every MRT station will have a little bakery. Um, where I would see kids or they're stopping at McDonald's to get a little shake or they're, they're getting a little tray of these pastries. Um, and, and so regardless of now the culture, it is certainly global, um, we are just constantly eating and it's always refined sugars and starches. So yeah, hyperinsulinemia is, I believe, the most common and relevant cause of insulin resistance. All right, thank you. It's me again. I'm from Basel, not from Singapore. I work with Duke university in Singapore, so I understand. I have three level of question, up to your timing, okay, I know. Please. First, when we're talking about carbs, protein, mm -hmm. meal is mixed meal. Usually we take mixed meal. Yeah. So the composition you just mentioned, 
could be different. In my own research channel, even McDonald's in different countries is different. It's the same menu. Yeah. So what is the effect, first question, of mixed meal, depending composition? Second, sequence. Well, let's do one at a time, because John may not let you ask all of them. So I, the I will first, just so you, finish. You just need to decide which is the most well, important. We will discuss sequence of eating, first proteins and okay, carbs. Yeah. And second, how fast you are eating. No need to answer. We can talk. Well, but yeah. So the third the one, mystery. I don't know. The third question, I can't answer. Um, like, in other, if they ate a big mixed macronutrient meal in five minutes versus 20, I'm not sure. I would just speculate. I bet that's been published, but I'm not familiar with it. I suspect it would just change the area under the curve from, I mean, similar area under the curve. But rather than being a huge spike, it would be a more prolonged hill rather than a mountain. And then going back, the second question was the timing of it all. Um, there's, there is good, reliable, consistent human evidence to suggest that if you're mixing macronutrients, the insulin impact will be less if the carbs come last. So put carbs in their proper place, put them at the back. Um, and then the, the idea of mixed macro, yes, I, I agree, it complicates it. But I kind of addressed that with Daria's question where I mentioned how it really is just the degree to which you're compressing the peak. The more you mix, the more you eat pure glucose, the more it's going to be big and then down, and even too far down with a rebound, depending on the person. And the more you've mixed that with other macronutrients, you've reduced the peak but extended um, the time. Um, however, I would I would say that it is possible. I think that we don't mix macros as much as most people, as much as we might think, because when we are going to the bag in the box with the barcode, very often it is essentially pure starch or pure sugar. In some instances it is pure sugar, like in the form of candy. In other instances, like chips, there's going to be some fat in there, um, but it's a relative modest amount based on this, the total amount of starch. So for all intents and purposes, if the primary source of carbohydrate is bags and boxes with barcodes, pardon me for continuing to say that, but then it will essentially be pure carbohydrate. Okay, thank you. It's like an ice cream example yesterday. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Hi, Ben. Thank you very much. I just wanted to um, add a comment for those of us who are full-time human pancreases. Um, <laughs> <laughs> once you take away the carbohydrates, then you can fully appreciate um, what a bad night of sleep is doing. Yeah. And um, I think my fellow type ones were kind of nodding when you were speaking. It's it's a big impact. It's um, you're insulin resistant for a day at least. Um, and then I have two very quick questions. Um, one, I think for a long time we used to see um, hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistance as this picture of a Japanese subway trying to put more people in. Yeah. And now you were explaining it as having the keys to the cell that are not working. How, how is this, um, what is the latest reason? Yeah, yeah, so I, that metaphor of, of the, you know, this Japanese metro line and you have the conductor person shoving the people in, I will sometimes use that exact same metaphor. If I, were to, if I had been giving a talk or we're giving a talk about uh, the changes in fat cell, because mm -hmm. that metaphor applies to the fat cell. It doesn't really apply to other cell types. Um, but that is when, uh, if I had gone through this talk, and rather than just showing individual stimuli of hyperinsulinemia, but rather if I similarly invoked tissues that begin to contribute to this, the first tissue I would have invoked would be the fat cell. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think those thoughts are not mutually exclusive, where it starts with us cramming the passengers in the train, at which point we can't cram any more in. So then I'm bringing in the other metaphor, was we mix the metaphors of the key that won't open the, the door anymore. That would be similar if we kept that metaphor going of we can't push any more passengers mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, basically what you're saying. But that is what happens when a fat cell undergoes significant hypertrophy. And it is significant. There's no other cell type in the body that is capable of that level of growth, where it can literally grow 10 or 20 times bigger than what the cell was in its origins. There's no cell that can undergo that growth. But then as the cell approaches a point of maximum dimension, dimension maximum because like the film, like the, the balloon of a water balloon that my kid may be filling, 
right as it's about to burst, mm -hmm. it has reached the surface tension that it can no longer contain. Yeah. That exact same physical phenomenon happens with an adipocyte. It reaches a point at which it can grow no further. In other words, the train car is totally and utterly filled with passengers. We've crammed them all in. Now, back to the, ad the hypertrophic adipocyte, even though insulin continues to push passengers in, passengers now start sneaking out the window. They're jumping out. That is what's happening with the hypertrophic adipocyte. It becomes insulin resistant in order to preserve itself, in order to prevent further growth. And so insulin is high. It should be inhibiting the breakdown of fat, but it can't do it anymore. The fat cell says, if I keep listening to you, I'm going to burst, and that will be very bad. So I'm going to, st I'm going to start leaking fats out, even though you're not, you don't want me to. Mm -hmm. That is... So that's how I think we can bring these ideas together. It is that the fat cell or the train car becomes full, and then it stops responding to any efforts to push more in, or rather to stay static. It starts leaking some out. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. I'm, I'm sorry to say this. Yeah, we're cutting no, into my next no, talk now. No. So I have my own, my own self-interest. So maybe we, we, just, need to, we just need to ban the, let's, let's just skip the mitochondria talk. No, I'm kidding. <laughs>